the next thing I want to prove is a result called uh, Louisville's theorem. Again, I'm not naming things as a funny business. I'm not sure how. Um, so Luva was a mathematician who he did work in complex analysis. Presumably he had something to do with this theorem, but he did not discover it. He did not prove it. I'm not sure why it has his name attached to it. Just kind of a historical uh, coincidence, a lot like L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital did not invent L'Hopital's rule. Louisville did not invent Louisville's theorem. It's just his name is attached to it and people have been calling it that for hundreds of years. So we're kind of stuck with it. So uh, what this theorem says is um, if you have a function and it's bounded and it's holomorphic everywhere. So if it's bounded and holomorphic everywhere, then the only functions that satisfy that are constant functions. So every entire uh, inbounded function is constant. Okay, so every bounded and entire function is constant. So uh, what I wanna do is let's prove this and we're gonna prove this using Cauchy's inequalities. So uh, by Cauchy's inequalities, so by Cauchy's inequality, um, uh, noting that since, if, say we have a function f, then um, f is gonna be holomorphic on the entire complex plane. That's what entire functions are. So by Cauchy's inequality, um, and, and since, uh, say the function that we're working with is f. So since f is holomorphic on G, um, remember what this means. So if f is holomorphic on, um, on the set G being the complex plane, uh, that means that it's infinitely differentiable there. All we actually need here is one derivative. Um, so by Cauchy's inequality, what we get is that the modulus of f prime is going to be less than or equal to, let's just think about what happens here when k is one. So we, when we have a first derivative, we're going to get one factorial, which is one, uh, less than or equal to m over r. So this is less than or equal to m over r. Here, this m, I should just point out, this m is going to be the m that we get from the boundedness condition on the function. So remember that to be bounded means that uh, capital F of Z is less than or equal to M for all values Z. Okay, so that's what bounded means. So that's where this M comes from. And this is the proof. Okay, this is really all we need. If you think about what this says, this forces the derivative to be zero because the left side is independent of R. So we can make R be whatever we want. And if R is sufficiently large, this quantity is as small as we want it to be. And it's like saying that something is less than epsilon for all epsilon. Well, the only way that that can work is if it's zero. So uh, since the left-hand side is independent of R, then by taking R to be larger and larger and larger, um, this forces the left-hand side to be zero. And since the modulus of this quantity is zero, um, that tells you that, um, since the modulus of this quantity is zero, that tells you that that quantity itself is zero. So F prime of Z is zero. Um, and this is true, by the way, for all. So this is true for all Z. Okay, and if you have a function whose derivative is zero for all Z, and if we're integrating over uh, a nice set. In this case, we're integrating over the complex plane, so everything's fine. Um, in particular, uh, F is constant. Okay, and so there's the proof. Okay, so every entire inbounded function is constant. Now, one footnote and one question for you. Uh, what about sine? Why is sine of z not a counterexample to this function, to this, uh, to this theorem? Okay, sine is certainly not constant. 
Okay, so just think about that. Why is this function f of z equals sine of z not a contradiction? Okay, why does that not violate the theorem?